Hello everybody and welcome to the Med Ace Biostatistics course for medical students. This is chapter 6 of section 1. In the last chapter we talked about two types of study errors. We talked about random error and the selection bias. We also mentioned some of the techniques used in research to decrease the risk of these errors. In this chapter we are going to talk about the next major group of bias, the information bias which is also known as the measurement bias. So what is on the agenda for chapter 6? We're going to start off with a refresher of the major types of errors in research, then we're going to introduce and define the measurement bias, next we will talk about the most common types of measurement bias that you need to know, then we will finish off with an overview of the most common techniques for controlling the measurement bias. Okay, so I already introduced you to this slide in chapter 5, but I want to bring it up again because it is extremely useful and easy to remember all the kinds of bias in research by grouping them into three major groups. I want you to understand that all the different kinds of bias which exist, such as the Berkson bias, attrition bias, recall bias, reporting bias, non-response bias, volunteer bias, etc can be grouped into three major groups of bias which are the selection bias, measurement bias, and confounding bias. In other words, these terms refer to broad families of bias for which many kinds of specific types of bias fall under. For example, observer bias and recall bias are forms of measurement bias. We spoke about random error and the selection bias as well as the methods to control for these types of errors in chapter 5. The subject of this chapter will be the measurement bias and the methods to control for this kind of bias. Just to clarify, the measurement bias and information bias both refer to the same types of bias. I will use them interchangeably in this lecture. So again, why is this important? Errors in the form of systematic error and random error are both threats to the validity of health research projects. Studies with poor validity will always make incorrect and unreliable study conclusions. As researchers and consumers of health research, it is our duty to recognize and understand these types of errors when they occur. Okay, so let's get started. What is the measurement bias? The measurement bias, or information bias, occurs due to errors in the measurements made. The measurement bias is a major threat to both internal and external validity. So why is the measurement bias different from the selection bias? Well, at the heart of every health research project are two major components, the population, or study sample, and the measurement, or the recordings. The selection bias involves errors in the former, that is, in the sample population. The information bias, on the other hand, involves errors in the latter, or in the way the information is collected. For example, you can have a study population which is representative of the target population, that is, it has low risk of selection bias. However, if you are not able to correctly measure the variables of interest, then your study will suffer from a different kind of bias, called the measurement bias. Therefore, it is possible to have a study which has low risk of selection bias, yet high risk of information bias. Okay, so what are the most common and important types of measurement bias? They are observer bias, recall bias, reporting bias, surveillance bias, the Hawthorne effect, and the lead time bias. Let's start with the observer bias. The observer bias occurs due to systematic differences between a true value and the value observed due to observer variation or preconceived notions regarding the study. In other words, the person in charge of making the measurements will incorrectly measure the true value due to preconceived notions regarding the study. For example, a pathologist looking at kidney biopsies is more likely to make a diagnosis of renal cancer in patients who they know have a long history of smoking just because they know that smoking is a major risk factor for renal cell cancer. In order to decrease the risk of the observer bias, many research projects employ a strategy known as blinding. In blinding, the observers are blind to the exposure variable, that is, they do not know who had the exposure and who didn't. We will talk more about blinding in section 3. For now, just realize that an important strategy for decreasing the risk of observer bias is to use blinding. Okay, now let's talk about the recall bias. The recall bias is a type of measurement bias which occurs when study participants remember 
or omit certain details. For example, cancer patients may be more likely to remember exposure to a risk factor than non-cancer patients. There is a type of study design which has a very high risk of this type of bias. This type of study design is known as the case control study. And in case control studies, researchers often ask patients who have an outcome such as cancer if they remember being exposed to a certain potential risk factor. This is a problem because patients with cancer or a particular disease often search for potential explanations for their negative outcome. Therefore, patients with a particular outcome are likely to overreport exposure to a potential risk factor. This leads to the recall bias. We will talk more about case control studies in section 3. For now, just realize that case control studies are very prone to recall bias if the methods used to uh, assess for the variables depends on the memory of patients. The key word for this kind of bias is memory. Now let's move on to the reporting bias. The reporting bias occurs when the measurements recorded are systematically different from the true values due to selective disclosure or withholding by the study subjects or researchers. For example, participants may underestimate how many cigarettes they smoke per day due to social stigma. This bias is very similar to the recall bias. However, unlike the recall bias, in this kind of bias, the subjects involved are consciously aware that they are altering their response. Both researchers and subjects may contribute reporting bias. Now let's talk about the surveillance bias. The surveillance bias occurs when the exposure group and control group are screened for the outcome variable differently. The most common form of this type of bias occurs when researchers search for the outcome more intensely in those who were exposed. For example, in a study looking to see if a risk factor is associated with cancer, researchers may perform more tests in those patients who they know were exposed to the risk factor than in those who were not exposed. Blinding and ensuring equal screening between study groups is the best way to avoid this kind of bias. Now let's talk about the Hawthorne effect. Although the Hawthorne effect does not sound like a type of bias because it doesn't have the word bias in its name, the Hawthorne effect is a type of bias because it is a source of systematic error. The Hawthorne effect occurs when study participants change their behavior because they know they are being observed. Since almost always study participants know that they are in a study and are being observed, it is extremely difficult to deal with this kind of bias. Luckily, this kind of bias is only an issue for factors which people can easily modify, such as diet and exercise. Typically, people are unable to change biological factors such as hormone levels or organ function. Now let's talk about the lead time bias. This is a favorite of the USMLE. The lead time bias occurs when earlier detection of a lethal disease is confused for increased survival when in reality there is no increase in survival time. For example, let's imagine that both of these lines represent the entire progression of a type of cancer from the moment the disease develops until the moment of death from the disease. In the bottom line, cancer is diagnosed typically at this stage and therefore the perceived survival is usually represented by this portion of the line. Now let's imagine a new test is developed which allows doctors to diagnose the cancer at an earlier stage. This is represented by the top line in which the cancer is now being detected at this stage. This portion of extra survival time is known as the lead time and it can sometimes be confused with an increase in overall survival due to earlier diagnosis and intervention of the disease. However, in reality, the reason that it seems that patients who are diagnosed earlier are living longer is simply because they are being diagnosed earlier in the natural progression of the disease and not because being diagnosed earlier increases survival time. So what can we do to decrease the risk of measurement bias in studies? Like the selection bias, it is often very difficult to fully reduce the risk of measurement bias. However, some techniques can help minimize it. These techniques include using a highly accurate measuring device, employing standardized methods for assessing variables, measuring key variables multiple times, blinding observers, and confirming the study participant responses with official records. Blinding and the other methods of protecting against the measurement bias will be covered in section 3 of this course when we talk about research designs.
For now, just realize that the most important way to decrease the risk of measurement bias is to ensure that the techniques used to measure the study variables are reliable and highly accurate. Alright, let's do some practice problems. A study is conducted to assess whether a compound found in baby formula is associated with increased risk of autism in children. A random sample of children diagnosed with autism is obtained and their parents are provided with a written questionnaire. Each child with autism is matched with another child of similar age and characteristics and their parents are also given the same questionnaire. Based on the study design used, what type of bias is this study at high risk for? Although we have not yet talked about case control studies in detail, this study is a case control study because the researchers are identifying subjects with the outcome variable first and then searching to see if those subjects were exposed to the exposure variable. As we mentioned before, a major weakness of case control studies is that they have a tendency to suffer from the recall bias if the assessment of the study variables, usually the exposure variable, depends on the memory of the study subjects. Given that the researchers are using a questionnaire or survey to assess for the exposure variable, which in this case is the baby formula, the researchers seem to be depending on the parents' recollection of which baby formula they used. Therefore, this study has a high risk of recall bias. As we said before, recall bias is a type of measurement or information bias because it is an error that arises due to the way that the measurements are made. Next example. A group of researchers are interested in knowing whether race of black is associated with increased risk of vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia, or VIN, compared to race of white. A sample of 500 biopsies that occurred due to clinical suspicion of VIN are obtained and analyzed by a group of pathologists. The pathologist had access to information about the race of each of the study participants before looking at the biopsies. Based on the study design used, what type of bias is this study at high risk for? Okay, so the problem here is that the observers, in this case the pathologists, were aware of who received the exposure variable, which in this case is the race of black. Therefore, if pathologists have a preconceived notion about what race is associated with the highest risk of VIN, they will tend to diagnose VIN more frequently in individuals of that race. This is a type of measurement bias called the observer bias because the preconceived notions of the observers are influencing the measurements made by the observer, which in this case is the diagnosis of VIN. The best way to prevent the observer bias is to blind the observers from the exposure status of the patients. This should have been done in this study. Next example. A study is performed to determine if motivational interviewing for weight loss is associated with weight loss. Researchers randomly assigned patients to either motivational interviewing or no motivational interviewing. Patients were followed every two months for a total of one year. At the end of the study, researchers determined that both groups lost a moderate amount of weight and there was no statistically significant difference in weight loss between the groups. Based on the study results, what type of bias may have occurred? Well, it seems that both groups lost a similar amount of weight. Given this outcome, it is important to consider if perhaps the factor that caused both groups to lose weight was the fact that they were both in a study about weight loss and were both followed up every two months to assess their weight. The study subjects may have felt the pressure of being in a study as a motivation for losing weight, despite receiving the intervention or not. This is known as the Hawthorne effect, and it most typically affects studies which measure outcomes that study participants can rapidly modify. Remember, the Hawthorne effect is a type of measurement bias because it affects the quality of the measurements being made. Next example. Researchers conduct a prospective cohort study to measure the association between postmenopausal estrogen exposure from hormone replacement therapy, HRT, and endometrial cancer. During the data analysis step, researchers determined that women in the exposure group had higher rates of endometrial biopsies due to increased rates of vaginal bleeding. Based on these findings, what type of bias may have occurred? Alright, so the problem here seems to be that the group of women with the exposure, or those who were taking the HRT, received more endometrial biopsies than those women who were not taking the HRT. Immediately, this is a red flag because the outcome variables were assessed differently between groups. This is an example of the surveillance bias, because the women who took the HRT were screened more frequently than those who didn't.
This is an error in the way that the variables are measured, therefore surveillance bias is a type of information or measurement bias. In order to minimize the risk of surveillance bias in this study, the women in both groups should have been screened an equal amount of times. Okay, so here are the take-home points for this chapter. Understand the definition of the measurement slash information bias. Recognize the different kinds of measurement slash information bias. And recognize that techniques such as blinding can help minimize the risk of measurement slash information bias. Thank you for watching and see you in the next chapter.